thank you all for joining today. Uh, we're really excited to speak to you uh, today on this topic of battery performance and safety simulation applied to electric aircraft. So we'll start with just a quick agenda on what we'll discuss today involving a very brief introduction to battery performance and safety simulation and why it's important. Uh, then we'll proceed to uh, looking at smart measurements to reduce physical testing and characterize aging or batteries. And then talk about how you can take a battery a physics model and extrapolate to conditions beyond where measurements might be able to take you. And then we'll wrap it up with the final section on battery thermal runaway and pack thermal modeling, followed by the conclusion. So when we look at the, an introduction to battery performance and safety simulation, uh, basically the, the future of electric aircraft is bright, uh, as you've seen some, from some of the earlier talks here, and uh, as well as I think that's uh, a presentation a moment ago. You can see there's a lot of uh, steam uh, that's gaining in the aircraft electrification market. And if you're looking at just uh, you know monetary values of this, you can see it's growing by billions of dollars to over eight billions of dollars uh, by 2030. And this is largely driven by the need to reduce carbon emissions and environmental pollution. Uh, and it also has the potential to reduce operational costs. And one of the cool things we've seen just in the last month is that the, the largest zero emissions plane uh, yet uh, made its first flight, uh, which was uh, based on a Cessna caravan, dubbed the E-caravan, which was powered by lithium-ion batteries and a Magnix motor. That was a 30-minute flight over Washington State. So uh, there continues to be great milestones in this area, and uh, see that uh, simulation uh, can play an important uh, factor uh, when it comes to looking at uh, developing electric aircraft. So when you look at the different motivations for simulation of uh, battery performance and, and safety, uh, the engineers are, are often faced with many challenges when designing electric aircraft systems involving batteries. And just throwing up a couple bullet points here just to uh, illustrate the point. Uh, in terms of battery selection, for example, how many cells are, are needed for uh, a given configuration? How many in series? How many in parallel? What type of uh, battery cells would, should be selected? Should it be pouch or cylindrical, prismatic, uh, and you know, other types? Uh, and then in terms of battery performance and degradation, important questions like how long of a flight uh, or duty cycle can the pack last for? Uh, is active thermal management uh, an important consideration for charging and discharging to ensure proper temperatures in the, in the pack. And uh, also, how long will these batteries last for? Uh, if you look at, uh, in terms of number of cycles that it can go through before uh, end of life, um, this is critical to understanding the economics of electrified powertrain. And this was illuminated in the previous presentation by Dr. Pencott at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and then other uh, important considerations include battery safety as well. Uh, so how hot does the pack get? Uh, is thermal runaway a concern, like we've seen from other lithium-ion packs in the, in the past? Uh, do you need a, a vented or an unvented pack uh, for a given design? Uh, a lot of these are, these are great questions that, that engineers are faced with and feel that the multi-physics simulation can really help address some of these challenges. And when it comes to multi-physics simulation and the, the realm of CAE simulation, uh, in product development. There's many tools uh, available on the market today and many ways of doing this type of analysis. And if we look at this as a spectrum, where on the left-hand side, uh, you have things like back of the envelope calculations, um, Excel spreadsheets uh, with different calculations, maybe for tax sizing and basic uh, requirements. Um, and then, you know, later on during the design cycle, as you get deeper and deeper into the uh, fixed design and CAD geometries available and so forth, you can really go into deep physics, including uh, 3D finite element uh, analysis, both from a structural standpoint and from a thermal standpoint, but also uh, looking at any, uh, if there's active cooling uh, on, the, on the packs, looking at CFD is also important as well. But that uh, right-hand side of the spectrum can really uh, take a long time to, to do those types of simulations. 
And what we'd like to see is that there are tools out on the marketplace today, uh, including one uh, called GT Suite, that really spans the entire uh, spectrum uh, in terms of fidelity of multi-physics simulation, where you can start with a very simple concept model early in the design phase, and then as that design is getting worked on and, and maturing, uh, you can really go deeper and deeper into understanding the overall system behavior. A little bit about uh, GT, GT Suite and the, the company behind GT Suite. Uh, so the GT Suite software is made by a company called Gamma Technologies with a headquarters outside of Chicago and western suburb called Westmont. And it was founded over 25 years ago, back in 1994. And the business is focused exclusively on simulation software research and development of a tool called GT Suite. Uh, GT Suite is a transient multi-physics tool and we'll get into a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Over the last 25 years, over 700 organizations around the world have used uh, GT Suite for simulation. And there is also uh, well known for world class support at uh, not only at the headquarters in Westmont, but also in Europe and in India, and also with uh, representatives by IDAJ for the Asian markets. Now, when it comes to electric aircraft multi physics, there are uh, several uh, types of physical domains that need to be considered. So, for example, uh, the electrical domain, uh, and the ability to construct electric circuits and, and powertrain components, including uh, motors uh, and electrical equivalent batteries and uh, any other types of components in the system to represent the entire uh, electric powertrain. Now, for those that are interested in diving deeper into battery uh, electrochemistry, there is an electrochemical library that allows engineers to look at uh, battery cells in detail uh, from a 1D to a full 3D uh, uh, perspective uh, to characterize in a predictive form uh, cell performance, uh, including uh, state of charge and state of health. And that includes also a predictive aging uh, model as well, and we'll get into a little more detail about what that means in a moment, uh, as well as uh, having a comprehensive validated uh, materials library uh, to study uh, many of the, the, the common materials out there today. There's other physical domains that are considered as well as it relates to electric aircraft, and uh, thermal uh, performance is, is also a very important thing to look at. Uh, whether it means representing a battery pack, for example, as a uh, thermal uh, system uh, that comprises of thermal networks or uh, looking at it from a finite element uh, perspective. Uh, and for active uh, cooling uh, in battery packs and electric motors and so forth, uh, there's a fluid flow library that's uh, based on 1D CFD uh, that allows engineers to model just about any gas, liquid, or two-phase uh, fluid or refrigerant. And the beauty about the multi-physics package and multi-physics simulation in general is that engineers can really uh, package these different uh, physical domains together, whether it be electrical, electrochemical, mechanical, uh, to look at things like stress analysis and the impacts and so forth. And you can really integrate these uh, different physical domains together to build a complete a virtual integrated aircraft or virtual Ironbird. And along with this, this allows uh, engineers to implement cre uh, creative controls logic uh, to command a system response. And for certain types of physical models that run faster than real time, this will also allows engineers to uh, integrate the model uh, with a physical controller uh, to do uh, virtual testing without actually uh, flying the aircraft. So if we dive a little deeper into some of these physical domains, we look at electrical modeling, for example. Here you can see a representative map of what uh, a model might look like comprised of different components of an electrical system, whether it be uh, an electrical equivalent battery model or um, an inverter or resistors, uh, conductors, and so forth, as well as uh, different types of uh, electric motors for, for powertrain. And uh, one of the interesting characterizations you can do is, is look at, for example, cell balancing uh, behavior in a pack over a transient uh, duty cycle to see 
if they've kind of given a pack configuration, are, are, is there good balancing uh, in the pack uh, to each of the cells uh, in general? Now, when it comes to electrical, uh, electrochemical uh, battery modeling, uh, the electrochemistry model uh, is uh, solving the, the Newman pseudo 2D electrochemical equations. And it's a, a 2D uh, model in the sense that uh, it's 1D, uh, uh, basically takes the uh, cell and divides it into the cathode, the separator, and the anode, and discretizes it actually along the pack, as you can see in this figure here, in a one-dimensional uh, direction uh, to model uh, the uh, electrolyte concentrations in a 1D sense. But it's also uh, 1D in the radial direction when analyzing the active material in the cathode and the anode. And so uh, with the lithium ion diffusion, both in the electrolyte, uh, but also in the active material, it's where it gets this 2D uh, naming convention from. And along with this, this allows uh, engineers to not only predict state of charge, but also a state of health uh, as it relates to uh, uh, different aging mechanisms that are supported. And uh, with this type of model building uh, exercise, there's a streamlined characterization process that's included. And we'll get into a little bit more about what that means in, in a bit. Um, but this model also includes a, a comprehensive materials library that's uh, been validated by thousands of, of coin cells um, at, at Penn State. Uh, and uh, there's also included in that is predictive uh, temperature capabilities, including temperature-dependent material properties. And these models tend to run uh, much faster than real time. And so in theory, you could integrate this with a, a hill bench uh, for controls calibration. And on the bottom right-hand side, you can see uh, how well of a performance prediction you could expect from a predictive a battery model like this. So that's uh, in this case comparing uh, just a, di a discharge test at different temperatures, uh, C rates, and so forth, uh, comparing that directly to uh, test data. Now, with the electrochemical battery modeling, uh, one of the, the beauties of, of this type of modeling is that you can really uh, deliver insights that are not practical through physical testing. So, for example, with the 1D. Uh, lithium ion uh, concentration model, you can see where the concentration is at anywhere in the pack uh, at any given moment in time. But you can also see how different aging mechanisms are changing over time as well, whether it be SCI layer growth or lithium plating and so forth. And obviously you can get uh, standard uh, performance outputs like state of charge, um, heat generation rate, internal resistance, and so forth. And so a lot of these uh, things that, that are indicators about the cell itself are, are simply not very easy to, to measure in testing. Now, when it comes to the battery aging model, there are several different aging mechanisms uh, that are included in the, in the model. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, SEI uh, layer growth mechanism, uh, lithium plating mechanism, and then active material cracking as well. And here with this graph on the bottom, you can see a comparison between a calibrated uh, model for aging compared to uh, test with very good agreement. And you can see this is a test uh, that simulates uh, several thousand uh, cycles uh, to compare uh, capacity fade uh, over, over cycle life. But to illustrate these aging mechanisms, uh, if we first maybe start with a, uh, a fresh cell, um, you can see if, if we're looking at um, the, uh, on the anode side, for example, the uh, active material, you can imagine, let's suppose this is graphite, uh, there's a, a thin layer of SEI uh, on, the, uh, on the graphite material itself. But in general, the, the lithium ions uh, are able to move very easily uh, through the cell. And so this uh, has high porosity uh, and very low resistance to lithium ion uh, movement. So there's good... Uh, uh, transport properties for that. But as the cell starts to age, you can see the uh, SEI layer uh, starts to grow on the graphite. Um, there's a little bit of a possible plating uh, included on the, on the age cell. Um, and what this leads to is lower capacity and lower porosity of the, of the cell itself. 
uh, leading to a higher internal resistance, and uh, it's not as easy, or, uh, easy for the lithium ions to, to, uh, to flow through the, through the cell. And then if we look at the, the cell at the end of life, you can see there's a, a thick layer uh, of SEI on the graphite. Uh, there's lithium metal uh, in the anode, and it's very low capacity and, and very high resistance. And so those aging mechanisms are included in the model to give you a predictive sense um, as a function of either cycle or even calendar aging, the behavior of the pack of the cell. Now, if we tie it all together and look at uh, the integrated multi-physics capabilities, uh, particularly as you get later into the design cycle and you have CAD uh, data available, you can start from that raw CAD file and bring that in to represent uh, the, either the cell or the pack uh, in, a, in a 3D sense, whether it be uh, looking at a thermal response in a uh, temperature distribution in the pack, example, as you see down on the bottom left, to even looking at um, you know, 2D or full 3D electrical distribution, uh, looking at current and SOC distribution within a cell. And then if there's active cooling uh, strategies applied to uh, a cell or a pack, um, there's the ability to model the fluid flow uh, that, and the conjugate heat transfer that goes along with that uh, to reject heat from the cell to keep it at a nice optimum temperature. Now, if we apply this to uh, real-world scenarios, um, there's a, a, a case that uh, was uh, done with an AIAA paper last year uh, in partnership with Airbus's A-Cubed uh, division. And here you can see, for example, the, the Bahana aircraft. Uh, and what it's doing is a, the electrical uh, multi-physics model allows engineers to take realistic scenarios to predict uh, behavior of the, the, the complete uh, powertrain system. And so uh, typical inputs might be what the commuting behavior looks like. Uh, so, for example, uh, this is borrowed from uh, Professor Venkat, uh, as he showed in a previous presentation, where you could impose different C rates and, and power uh, profiles uh, representing different missions in flight cycles. Uh, you can also uh, study the impact of different charging patterns on uh, pack performance and degradation, whether it be uh, kind of a CCCV type charge or boost charging or, or pulse charging. There's a lot of different scenarios you could go through there uh, to analyze the impact on, on uh, cell and pack performance. But even things like weather um, can influence uh, pack for performance as well, uh, particularly if those, those cells are exposed to, uh, to the elements. And so you can combine all of these different types of inputs to really give you a good realistic uh, simulation of what's happening uh, at the, the powertrain and vehicle level. Now we'll switch gears here to talk a little bit about how uh, physical testing that's commonly done today on battery cells to characterize its performance could perhaps be reduced uh, and uh, supplemented with uh, virtual testing to reduce cost and, and time to, to market. And so if we look at, for example, uh, different types of battery tests that we uh, commonly done uh, on different cells, um, there, there's many types uh, and common forms, but these can be expensive in terms of the time it takes uh, to run these tests, but also the, the amount of cost that it, that it has to, to do a physical test. And there's also raising uh, safety concerns, particularly when you look at things like thermal runaway. And so here's a, a few snippets of some common tests that, that we've seen. Um, and actually, there's a nice study uh, done by Farisha at a, a conference last year that shows um, constant current discharge testing as well as uh, HPPC testing, is, uh, the, the pulse type testing, also uh, other types of uh, aging and degradation tests, including calendar aging and cycle aging, uh, are, are typically performed. But, you know, if we look at uh, utilizing a simulation tool that's predictive in nature, this could uh, cut down on the number of physical tests that are required and thereby saving costs and, and slashing time uh, to market. And if we look at uh, the, the smart solution here, it really combines uh, a limited data set that's still required for, for simulations to, to be calibrated. But once you have a calibrated model, 
if you combine that limited testing data to extrapolated conditions that aren't run in tests uh, to give uh, real world um, predictions of, of what happens inside the cell or the pack. And so here's just uh, some other scenarios that were run by that same study uh, last year, uh, looking at a uh, comparison between a calibrated uh, model, electrochemistry model that's fully predictive for an HPPC test, and you can see uh, voltage current is, is transiently changing in time, and the model is responding to those fast transients that are occurring. In addition to that, also just standard discharge curves, um, the common test that's done, and you see there's, there's quite good agreement between at different uh, C rates um, for the test, uh, quite good agreement between the, the model and the test, and not only for, for voltage or, or SOC, but also for uh, temperature as well as, as temperature can play an important role for this. And so when we look at the workflow that's required to create calibrated uh, predictive battery models, uh, common inputs to these uh, battery models include uh, basic uh, cell dimensions, so specifying whether it's a cylindrical cell or a pouch cell and so forth, but also uh, inputting the, the chemistry of the cell, so what the active material is for the anode and the cathode and the, the electrolyte and so forth, as well as uh, layer thicknesses uh, for each of these, these parts of the cell. And then accompanied with the, the physical dimensions and properties of the cell, uh, if you accompany that with physical testing in a limited data set, uh, whether it be low C rate discharging to characterize open circuit voltage or HPPC tests or aging data, what you can do is take that model that's based on physical inputs, and there are certain parameters that can be um, uh, basically calibrated to match uh, certain uh, test data that gives you a calibrated cell. And the way this is done is uh, through uh, fitting uh, certain parameters, uh, whether it be uh, you know, first charge capacity or discharge capacity, uh, diffusivities and things like that, uh, contact resistances, those types of things. If you could go in there and, and uh, play with that, it can run very quickly uh, many uh, hundreds or, or thousands of cases uh, with the integrated uh, design of experiment setup and design optimizer to arrive at a nice calibrated cell in a very time efficient manner. And the beauty is once you have that calibrated cell, you can then uh, run the cell in realistic scenarios that you might not have testing data for. Um, and based on that too, you can also create uh, performance maps um, and, and generate uh, reduced order models that you might uh, put into uh, a full vehicle level model or uh, repurpose. Now, if we talk about extrapolating to conditions uh, beyond measurements, uh, one of the important scenarios that you can see on this uh, particular slide is uh, considering, uh, for example, an EV tall flight cycle. Uh, let's say you can imagine, you know, you're early on in, in the program, you've got some limited flight testing data, but you haven't really pushed that aircraft to the envelope to know how long can it really uh, last up in the air before you know you, your, your thresholds and your margins really break down. And so without actually you know, putting it to the limit, engineers can get some valuable insight before that physical test is even run to predict what that max flight duration might be before that test is run. And so for example, you can see on this plot here, uh, we've done a previous study with uh, the Airbus uh, Bahana uh, aircraft, and it's looking at SOC as a function of uh, flight time with very good agreement. Um, but, you know, during certain parts of the, of the cycle, uh, engineers might know, uh, well, you know, how far can we really push this, this, this flight envelope? Um, a simulation like this can really give you uh, good indications uh, and uh, more confidence in the safety margins that are being used for physical testing. Now, in addition to that, there's also the ability to uh, reduce uh, the amount of time it takes to even run aging type of, of scenarios. So one common uh, thing to do with calendar aging, for example, is to test a cell and look at capacity uh, over, over time. And this amount of time might take on the order of years, uh, several years, as you can even see in this uh, graph here, where you're looking at over two years of, uh, 
of data compilation. And um, here you can see uh, there's different, uh, based on different temperatures and so forth, you can really see how well uh, the model is reproducing what's happening in the, in the physical test. But let's say engineers didn't want to wait two years to know how the, the simulation might predict what's happening. Based on a, a smaller limited data set of data, let's say you only took the first year of data, how well would the model be able to extrapolate to these conditions? And so if you look at these set of plots here, the gray being uh, what's uh, basically pure prediction, uh, relying on only the physical data in, that's dotted here in the white. And so if you look at, if you take all of the entirety of the physical data, you can see there's a uh, nice agreement overall uh, between the model and test. But as you start to strip out some of that physical data and, uh, and input to the model, you can see this model still performs quite well in the gray regions where we're relying on our pure predictions to, to show what happens in testing. And so this should give engineers some confidence that it is possible to predict uh, beyond where the physical measurements are, are being taken. Now, if you look at, uh, there's many different cases that, that just simply can't be tested. Uh, for example, with real world uh, electric aircraft duty cycles. Uh, if you had, for example, a calibrated aging model, uh, you could put in that realistic duty cycle that may not have ever been uh, tested for uh, aging and so forth, and give a true prediction of, well, how long is the uh, how long is the pack going to last? How how many how many cycles can this run? Or how many years can we we run this? And this gives engineers more insight about the economics of a particular uh, cell and, and pack design. So let's transition a little bit here too to talk about uh, battery thermal modeling and uh, thermal runaway propagation as well. So. When we look at uh, thermal runaway uh, in uh, electric aircraft, there are government standards that uh, require uh, battery packs be protected against thermal runaway. So for example, the DO311A standard has uh, different uh, specifications of how to uh, perform a thermal runaway test to, to meet uh, certification and so forth. And today, this is really done primarily through expensive testing. Uh, it, it really involves uh, heating up a cell to the point where uh, either explodes or uncorks, and then uh, seeing how well that the uh, energy, if it propagates to other cells, to really have a, a runaway event. Um, but if you bring in a multi-physics simulation, it would allow engineers to really explore the design space a, a lot more than what the limited physical testing might give you. So for example, uh, engineers, let's, if we looked at this simple uh, cylindrical pack here, engineers could selectively uh, heat up any of these cells, whereas maybe in a physical test you're limited to just a couple of the worst case scenarios that you think uh, might might have a problem. But in simulation, uh, you know the the world's really your, uh, your oyster here, where you can uh, analyze uh, any given cell uh, to see its impact if it if it causes thermal runaway. You can also look at other influences. Uh, for example, uh, if your uh, insulation material. Do you need to insulate? Do you not need to insulate? Can you get by with air cooling? Uh, do you need to have some sort of active thermal management strategy like water cooling? If the pack uh, can't be vented, uh, what kind of pressure uh, are you seeing inside the pack um, that that'll, will help you size uh, the, uh, the casing and so forth for the pack? Lots of uh, central questions that could be um, uh, insight can be gained uh, in analyzing uh, for example, thermal runaway with simulation. So if we carry this uh, with a simple example here. There's a, a, a battery pack of cylindrical cells here, 1860, 650 cells with a, a four series 21P uh, layout. And what's being done here in the simulation is it's just comparing two different thermal management strategies, uh, one being uh, with passive air cooling on the left and the other being uh, with uh, uh, indirect liquid cooling, similar to what you might see in a, in a Tesla with a, a bandolero roll uh, cooling and so forth. And so uh, if we study this with a, a thermal runaway type model, engineers could go into any of these individual cells in the pack and selectively heat them to the point where the cell um, uh, goes into uh, thermal 
runaway parts and see how well that, that runaway uh, propagates to the other cells. And so if we just do a brief uh, demonstration of these results here, if you go through a standard uh, eBTOL mission uh, profile, uh, where the cell current is, is sort of changing over the entirety of the flight mission, you can see for, if we look at the C rate, uh, you know, the, in the currents through each cell, you can see that the pack is pretty well balanced when we analyze all of these different cells together on one graph. Um, there's a little bit of variance here just due to uh, thermal uh, differences between some of the cells. But by and large, you know, the, there's pretty good uh, behavior in a normal scenario. But now when you heat up one of the cells, and we just chose an arbitrary cell in the pack, you can see uh, after a certain point uh, of heating, the cell no longer is participating. Uh, the cell current itself drops to, to zero. And that energy um, given off by the, uh, the single cell uh, explosion and so forth uh, can propagate uh, to other uh, cells inside the pack and thereby changing the, the current uh, distribution uh, carried by the different cells, but also looking at how the temperature in the neighboring cells also changes. And so this is a, a scenario where uh, if you blew up one of the cells, you would likely have uh, serious uh, issues uh, uh, with the pack being able to survive this type of scenario. Now, if you went into the case of uh, a liquid cooling type scenario, and we selectively heated that same uh, cell, um, the, the, the cell might be no longer participating, but the, the load carried by the other cells, there's still pretty good cell balancing, and the temperature uh, variance between the different cells is much smaller than what you would see with a, an air-cooled type pack. So uh, simulation modeling like this can really give users some insights about what the behavior might look like in a, in a thermal runaway type event. Now, just to round this out, in, in looking at battery pack thermal modeling in general, there's also a nice validation study that was done, uh, performed by Ryan Metal at a, a previous uh, conference, uh, a GT users conference uh, last year, where uh, looking at, uh, in this case, a prismatic uh, cell type of, of pack here and, and looking at over a duty cycle, in this case, uh, just a, a caustic uh, current uh, discharge type event. The, the model is set up such to study the temperature of each individual cell inside the pack. In this case, uh, they were close to uh, 64 cells, uh, and this is a 48 volt application. And what you can see is in this graph here, uh, for the, the dis discharge test, you can see uh, individual cells are colored with different uh, curves here inside the plot. And the lower bound here is what the test minimum cell uh, temperature profile looks like. And the maximum here is what the uh, maximum recorded test temperature looks like. And you can see the, the model predicts quite well what that spread is between the, the minimum and the maximum uh, to really give users uh, confidence in a, a model like this to allow them to extrapolate beyond, okay, well, we've, we've simulated this and compared it to a 1C discharge test. Now what does it do in a, in a real driving cycle? What type of behavior does that give? That engineers might not have uh, testing capabilities for that yet. So just to wrap this up with conclusions, hopefully after this talk, uh, you folks have been able to understand uh, some of the insights that multi-physics simulation can bring to studying electric aircraft powertrain systems with batteries. And this space is continuing to grow. Uh, research and development continues to, to gain strength. And along with that, and uh, it's key in, in our opinion to uh, utilize and harness the power of multi-physics simulation to not only uh, allow engineers to study uh, cells inside a pack in, in more detail, but look over the entire uh, virtual integrated aircraft uh, to, to speed up, help speed up uh, the development cycle. And so with that, uh, I think that concludes uh, this presentation and I'd be happy to open it up uh, to uh, any uh, questions that you might have. And uh, thanks again for tuning in.